be seated. Welcome. Friends, we're gathered here today to find comfort. We're gathered here today to share memories of Nancy and the way that she's touched our lives. And we're here today to celebrate her resurrection, to celebrate the eternal life promised to her in her Savior, Jesus Christ. And so today is a time of remembrance, and it's also a time of worship. And so will you uh, join me please in prayer? God, you are our refuge and strength. And we pray that today as we come together to remember Nancy's life, that you would remind us that our help is in the name of the Lord, the one who made heaven and earth. We pray that you'd touch us in uh, our time of need right now. We pray that you'd receive our thanks for, Nat for uh, Nancy's life. As we gather together, help us to renew our trust in Christ, who by dying on the cross has freed us from eternal death and by rising has opened the gates of heaven. And we're thankful that our sister Nancy shared in Christ's victory over death and now knows all that that means. And so we pray today not for her but for ourselves that you would grant us the gift of your loving consolation, Father. Lord, you brought us to birth. You envisioned us before we were born and all our days are in your hands. And you're always ready to hear us when we pray. So even now as sorrow pierces our hearts at the death of Nancy, we grope for words to express our pain to one another and we cherish the memories we have. We lay those needs before you, trusting that you're ready to supply everything we need out of the riches of your grace in Jesus Christ. Show us now that grace that as we face the mystery of death, we might see the light of hope of eternity that you promise in your word. Speak to us once more the message of life in Jesus Christ, our Lord, and help us to live as those prepared to die and help us to console one another well today and to cherish the memories that we share. In Jesus' name, we pray for your glory. Amen. I want to share just uh, a few passages of scripture with you today because words often fail us and probably should uh, at a time of loss and death and yet God always has a word for us and so in addition to reminding us that God is our refuge and strength uh, the Lord tells us this as a father has compassion on his children so the Lord has compassion on all those who fear him for he knows how we're formed and remembers that we are dust We're told uh, by Jesus himself, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And he also said, come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I will surely give you rest. And finally, the Lord Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Which led one of his followers, Peter, to write, Praise be to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for in his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish or spoil or fade, which is kept in heaven. For you. You've all read the obituary and you all also know much more of Nancy than is written there. Uh, I'm anxious to hear some of those stories during our fellowship time. I got to know Nancy maybe 
a little more than a year ago when she started coming to our church. Uh, my connection with Nancy initially was my wife Julie met her when she was a volunteer driver and had given Nancy a ride a few times. I suppose the drivers really shouldn't talk with their family about the people they drive around. Once in a while I'd hear about uh, someone that was really grouchy or, <laughs> or someone whose spouse <laughs> was really grouchy. And, uh, but I, I, I heard about this wonderful lady that Julie had met and uh, they had some good conversations and uh, then one Sunday uh, Nancy wanted to come to church here and uh, the first Sunday she came I believe she came in a wheelchair uh, that's most most of the time that that I've known Nancy she's uh, pretty much had to to be confined to that wheelchair um, and Nancy quickly got connected with quite a number of people here her positive attitude and her friendly spirit were contagious. And I soon learned visiting with Nancy that her life hadn't always been easy, especially the last few years. And we walked through some of that with her in, in the time that we knew her. I remember talking with her in, in the hospital right after they'd had to amputate her thumb. And, and she didn't know going in and, and found out, you know, after she came out of anesthesia and I was surprised with the way she handled that. Honestly, I, 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 I shouldn't have been surprised, but I'd only known her a short while. And the more I've gotten to know Nancy, the more I saw that her resilience and her positive spirit flowed out of a full life that many of you had an opportunity to witness. I uh, try to imagine Nancy in earlier days, you know, managing one of the gas stations and the relationships she must have had with vendors and with customers and with the crew. Uh, you know the tireless labors of love that went into clothes and costumes for kids and grandkids and you've shared some of those stories. Many of you know uh, the rich and full and active life that was complicated in recent years by health problems. And all of us have seen the part of Nancy that illness and tragedy could not take away. And that's truly been a blessing. Our congregation has truly been blessed by Nancy. Her smile and warm, steady spirit have been an encouragement, sometimes to the very people who wanted to offer encouragement to her. And isn't that wonderful? Uh, and we were not ready for this, were we? Ready for today. Just a short time ago, I remember a visit at the atrium where Nancy was feeling so much better and healing up and looking for the day when she could make it to church again and do some of the other things that she hadn't been able to do for a while. And then so suddenly it wasn't meant to be. But we are richer for having known Nancy and poorer now for having lost her. And the loss is ours. And we feel that sorely today because of what we had, because of who Nancy was to us. And so today is hard for us, but no tears for her. She led a full life and now she stepped into an eternity God has prepared for her. And we need to cling to that today that there's no more cancer, no more pain, no illness, no cares for her. And we're thankful for her life and for the opportunity to love her and be loved by her and for all the memories today brings, back, bring, brings to our minds. And, and there are things about Nancy we don't ever want to forget, aren't there? And we want to emulate and, and pass along and so today, we say thank you, Lord, for our dear friend and sister Nancy. Thank you for the grace you've shown her and for the blessing she's brought into our lives. Amen. Let me share a passage of scripture with you that uh, we talked about when the family got together. Uh, when I heard it, I thought, oh yeah, I've heard, I, I, I know that's used for funerals, and then I realized I don't think I've ever used it for a, 
for a memorial service or a funeral. And uh, it, it's a passage we are all probably somewhat familiar with because there are a number of songs that have grabbed the words from this text. And uh, I'll mention a couple of them in a little while, and you'll probably be able to think of more as, as you hear me read it. Um, it's from Ecclesiastes 3, where we read this. There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain, a time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. And then the writer goes on to say, what does the worker gain from his toil? For I've seen the burden God has laid on men. He's made everything beautiful in its time and he's also set eternity in the hearts of people. Yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. So it's a beautiful poem, isn't it? And, uh, and yet it's not an easy passage for us to understand or take hold of. You had to pick that one, didn't you? <laughs> no, it's, it, it is, it's uh, you know, the time poem here. Uh, 28 items are mentioned, 14 pairs, and they're not all good things, are they? In fact, usually something that we would think of as very positive and wonderful is paired with something that's difficult. And that does kind of describe life, doesn't it? Each good time has its corresponding challenge, and you know, it starts with the time to be born and a time to die, which has, uh, you know, it's all encompassing right there in that first pair, and yet says, Everything is beautiful in a way. Everything is appropriate in its time. There are times that affection is appropriate and time that it's not. There's, there's a time to speak and, and a time just, just to be there with someone. You've probably experienced that even this morning. There's uh, a time to hold on. And there's a time to let go. And we want to hold on. And God says it's time to let go. We get so busy with life, and, and uh, what, what this passage does is it, it makes us time conscious in the best way because it helps us think about the things that are really important in life. So we've written songs about this, you know, everything is beautiful in its own way, right? That probably came from this turn, turn, turn is probably the, the one that comes to our minds the most. But I wonder if this passage is a little bit more like a Harry Chapin tune, Cats in the Cradle. Because it, it really makes us think about the brevity of life and the scope of eternity and the importance of cherishing the moments we have. And I know you've had some moments that, that you have cherished that you've been able to share today, and that's a great thing, and keep doing that and, and hang on to it, you know. But it also asks... A big question, is this all there is? is? So we, you know, we have good days and bad days, we live and die, and what are we here for? That's something that, that the writer of Ecclesiastes 3 was kind of struggling with. It's sort of written from a skeptic's point of view. And, and he says for a moment, is, does that mean everything's just kind of meaningless? What is there to show for all the planting and plucking and harming and healing and marring and mending and packing and pitching that goes on in life are all these things and you know that we don't have any control over is there is there any meaning to them all every human life has a span and and then what we aren't as in control as we want to be and and so for just a moment the writer of Ecclesiastes struggles with that and 
in his heart, he knows there's, there's meaning and purpose in life, but he's frustrated trying to make sense of it. And then comes verse 11. And some people say this verse is the heart of the whole book of Ecclesiastes. God has made everything beautiful in its time and has also set eternity in the hearts of people. And we, we can't figure it out, but we believe that. In fact, the, the writer of Ecclesiastes talks about everything else kind of happening under the sun, and, and that phrase is used several times, and what it, what it clues us into is there's another perspective available that we can't always see. And he calls it eternity, that, that Hebrew just meant for, forever, something that goes on forever. And the idea was that history is going someplace and life isn't meaningless. Far from being a fatalist, he's come to appreciate that God's in control even of time. And figures we need to be reminded of that. And so there's two realities really today that, that we need to hang on to. And, and the one is God's purposes can't be discerned. We don't always figure out God's timing. A lot of life is a mystery. It's, it's like a tapestry. Have you ever seen a beautiful tapestry and then looked at the back of it and it's just a mishmash of threads? And sometimes all we see is the mishmash of threads, but God is weaving the tapestry. And if we could see it from the other side, that's what we would see is the beauty and order of it, even the things that seem meaningless to us. The writer of Ecclesiastes is saying there's a time for everything and it's, it's, it's all in, in God's mind. There was a time for our Savior to come. Galatians 4 says, at just the right time, Jesus came into this world. And there are a number of times through the Gospels that Jesus said, my time hasn't come yet. And, and then Romans 5 tells us at just the right time, at just the right time, Jesus went to the cross for us so that we could be forgiven and have the assurance of an eternal life with him. God's able to make even death, disease, and even our own foolish choices serve in the big picture. And then the other side of that is God's given us an inkling of that, an awareness deep down of his eternal plan. And the beauty comes in recognizing and acknowledging the place and purpose of every person, every thing, every event in that overall plan. And so we can step back and we can imagine the big picture without having to know all the details. So what do we do with that today? Well, I think putting life in that perspective helps us to live fully today. And I think I saw some of that in Nancy. That because she knew God had a purpose and God had a plan, uh, even in some really hard times, even in the last year, uh, I think that, that helped her to live with the attitude that she had. I was um, there for the last time by her bedside in the hospital in Wausau, and uh, this happened to me more than once. I don't know how Nancy worked this out. One time in Riverview, there were like a chaplain and two pastors there within minutes to see her. And I thought, was she kind of playing the field here or something? <laughs> so I, I, was, I was up in, in Wausau, and um, a hospital chaplain priest came in while we were visiting. And so, um, you know, I didn't kick him out. I just <laughs> said, hey, this is good. And she says, I can use all the prayers I can get. And, uh, but, you know, I think he'd probably seen her chart or something or somebody had tipped him off. And uh, I think he realized uh, how close to the end she was. And I didn't. He did a way better job than I did. <laughs> Uh, but but as as uh, as he shared uh, some thoughts with her, um, he asked her about the seriousness of her diagnosis, and then said something like, "Are you okay with that?" And she was. <laughs> I mean, she'd rather be here with us. 
but it, it was good to see the peace, you know. The Lord not only helps us live fully to, for today, but he helps us to, to, to li live with confidence toward a life beyond. And there's a little bit of longing for something more in all of us, and that longing's been fulfilled for Nancy now. C.S. Lewis said it this way once. He said, I find myself in myself a desire which no experience in this world can fully satisfy. And the most probable explanation is I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures fully satisfy it, that doesn't prove the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it fully, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. And then Lewis said, the sweetest thing in all my life has been the longing to find a place where all the beauty came from. Elsewhere, he describes this longing as the scent of a flower we have not found, the echo of a tune we've not heard, the news of a country we've not yet visited. And the promise of God's word is that Nancy's got a glimpse of that now. Uh, of something we can't imagine. Nancy knew Christ as her savior and friend, and I believe she's with him now. The Lord says to be absent from the body is to be present with him. And whatever it is she's experiencing in this moment, all her longings are now perfectly fulfilled in the presence of her savior. And that's the comfort we need to cling to this morning. And so uh, let's picture her in a garden with Jesus, I guess, as uh, we listen to this song.
Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for Nancy's life and all of the ways that uh, she's touched our lives. And we thank you that in our sorrow and our loss, you've promised to be there for us. And so uh, I pray that you'd lift our heavy hearts and oh. that you'd supply daily the, the grace and the hope and the trust that we need. I pray that you'd help us to carry Nancy's memory with us and to take the very best things that you graced us with in Nancy's life and, and to uh, be the same for others in, uh, in the way that you equip us. I pray that you would um, give strength to Lori and to Lisa and to Paul that you would be with Dorothy and Jim, that you would watch over each dear friend of Nancy who so painfully feels the loss that we experience today, and that you would give us courage, give us strength, and give us your peace, which you've promised us is of such a quality that it passes all understanding. May that be true each one here. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Will you join me in singing Amazing Grace? It is number 288. Two
equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what's pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And so now, uh, we bid farewell to the earthly remains of Nancy, our sister, and we lift up our hearts to God by faith, and we pray, Lord, help us to see this death as a doorway to life for Nancy, as indeed you have promised. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and our coming King. Amen. Amen. We're dismissed, and will you please uh, wait for the family first to uh, enter the fellowship hall and follow along. Mm -hmm.